Today, our psalm is Psalm 96. Psalm 96 is a psalm of rejoicing that is distinctive in its address to a universal audience. Now, here's what's really interesting about Psalm 96 is that the verses are found in other places. Now, we don't know when the psalm is written, and so it's hard to know which came first. But Benjamin Siegel, who I so admire as a commentator on psalms, says that the familiarity, which some say is as many as 60% of the phrasing can be found elsewhere, was to create a quality of familiarity to the listener. And yet as a collage, it is distinctive, distinctive in its universal message and audience. But if you look specifically at 1 Chronicle 16, verses 23 to 33 in particular, you'll find a lot of these phrases, the same imagery as here. The context in 1 Chronicles is a description of David taking back the ark that had been captured by the Philistines and bringing it to Jerusalem. Though in 1 Chronicles it'll say that King David assigned to Asaph and his brothers to write the, celebra the celebratory event. And so later commentators will say that this was an extension of that bringing the ark and from capture. That's important from capture because this psalm is a sheer chadash, a new song pointing to some transformation, some new event. The classic commentators, Rashi and Radak, will point to the future and they say, what is the singularity? What is the single event that this psalm is reacting to? It's the messianic future. And this is a psalm of a future time. But others would identify it as a psalm King David in the singularity of taking the ark that had been captured and reclaiming it. Here's a tease going forward. This will be a psalm in which nature is singing and dancing to God. Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, that important medieval commentator, he will say, that even the fish will be singing to God. I just love that image in regarding verse 11, that even the fish, David Kimchi lived in France, 1160 to 1235, even the fish will sing God's praises. Now, I tend to see that as all metaphor, not literal. And, at the, and in the course of my description of this psalm, I want to talk a little bit about animism, where all of life is considered imbued with spirits, and what's distinctive to monotheism. But let me first pull up and read this psalm, which, again, we're in Kabbalat Shabbat. In Kabbalat Shabbat, this is the psalm of Monday. Yesterday we did Sunday. Here's something, you know, yesterday's Psalm 95 ended with, I'm not going to let that generation go into the land, right? As if God is rejecting the Israelites. Do note that in Psalm 96, Israel is never mentioned by name. The people of Israel are never ostensibly addressed directly. The audience seems to be much broader. When we get to Psalm 99, which will be the Thursday psalm, I'll review the order of these psalms and how they're linked and where Israel is. But first, our psalm of today, Psalm 96. Sing to Adonai a new song. Sing to Adonai all the earth. Sing to Adonai, bless God's name. Proclaim from day to day God's deliverance. 
recount among the peoples God's glory, among all the nations God's wonders. For great is Adonai and very praiseworthy. Awesome is God above all gods. For all the gods, with a small g, all the gods of the nations are idols. But Adonai has made the heavens. Grandeur and radiance are before God. Strength and splendor are in God's holy place. Ascribe to Adonai families of nations. Ascribe to Adonai glory and strength. Ascribe to Adonai the glory of God's name. Bear a gift and come to God's courtyards. Bow down to Adonai with the radiance of holiness. Tremble before God all the earth. Say among the peoples, Adonai reigns. Fixed is the world not to be moved. God judges nations with uprightness. Let the heavens make a simcha, and let the earth be glad. Let roar the sea and its fullness. Let exalt the field and all that is in it. Then they will sing joyfully all the trees of the forest before Adonai, for God is coming, for God is coming to judge the earth. God will judge the world with righteousness nations with God's faithfulness. Now the trajectory of this psalm is toward justice. That's clearly the motif in the concluding line. God is coming to judge the earth. God will judge the world with righteousness, nations with God's faithfulness. Emunato, in our Sidur, Lev Shalem, which I so value, the last word is translated as with divine truth. So the trajectory of the psalm, the description of the God that calls and prompts celebration and rejoicing is precisely a king of kings who is a God of justice, who creates a moral order that is mirrored in a natural order. Now the artistry of how this psalm comes together. You'll see in verses 1 and 2 the word sing three times. Shiru Ladonai Shir Hadash, Shiru Ladonai Kala Aretz, Shiru Ladonai Baruch So three times the verb sing, sing, sing. And then you get three times here in verse 7 and 8, the word ascribe, havu, havu can mean attribute or give, bring to Adonai. Ascribe to Adonai three times. Benjamin Siegel, who again does a literary analysis, says that this type of poetic device of a threefold triadic repetition is Canaanite. It's even pre-Israelite, which again, he would emphasize that earlier <clears throat> and familiar poetic techniques are used to create for the audience a sense of familiarity. And at the same time, this collage is distinctive because of its full focus on the nations of the world. It's universal in its call. The, at the same time, the word used for God repeatedly is yud hey vav -Hey. So look at the very beginning. Sing to Adonai, sing to yud hey vav -Hey, a new song. That is the name yud hey vav -Hey, distinctly used by the Israelites by the Jews for their distinctive relationship with God. It's not Elohim, which is, a, or El, a more generic name of God. And so there's a paradox. And the paradox is the audience seems to be recount among the peoples, among all the nations, as in verse 3. But the people doing the recounting are the Israelites. So it's a call on the Israelites to proclaim to the world the universality of this God. 
the way the psalm is divided is into three parts. Verses 1 to 6 are, let us joyfully laud God, 1 to 6. Again, that opens with those three verbs of sing. And then verses 7 to 9 is the next unit. Here with the three verbs, ascribe, 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 havu, bring, ladonai, to God. Verses 7 to 9. And again, Benjamin Siegel with a, a clear literary analysis would say, if you count the verbs from verses 1 to 9, you have 14 verbs, active verbs, which is 2 times 7. 7, of course, equals completion. This is doubly complete. There's this sense of energy, the sense of rejoicing of honoring God, which leads to the third section, which is verses 10 to 13. And here there's a sandwich effect. Verses 10 and 13 talk about God as judge. That's the moral order. And the in-between part, verses 11 and 12, is a description of nature and its quality of rejoicing and order. I use, as you know, at least 10 different translations in creating before you my own translation, and I go back and forth. Some of the things I've gone back and forth with throughout this is there are two different words used for nations. One is amim and the other is goyim, and whether you, I call them nations or peoples, they're actually synonyms goes in two directions. The word that gets repeated with that number seven, remarkably, is the word call, all. This is comprehensive. But the middle words, which you know of, I count to see what the bullseye is, the middle three words are in verse 8. Ladonai kavod shemo. To yud he vav he, the ever-present one. Kavod, glory, be his name. His name is again the yud he vav he. So you got yud he vav he on either side with glory. This is a song that glorifies God. All right, to start over again with some key words to point out. And that is the sandwich, the inclusio, the key word at the beginning and the end, is the word aretz, all the earth. This is about all of creation, all the word, world. And you can see how aretz, verse 13, God is coming to judge the earth. You're in verse 2. Sing to Adonai all the earth. So that's the frame, the envelope. The word Shemo in two, sing to Adonai, bless God's name. That Shmo will also be in verse eight, linking the first and second sections. And again, the, the triplets of verses one and two, and then seven and eight as a rhythm. Benjamin Siegel said it's like Beethoven. It's not the words that get repeated, it's the rhythm. Da, 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 da. So here we get the rhythm of these three words being repeated that create continuity and sections. You get as well with this threefold mention in 1 and 2 and 7 and 8, for the rabbis in their commentaries, later on, Midrash to Hilim, they'll identify that homiletically with the three daily services, morning, afternoon, and evening. And they'll read in that that's what's being conveyed. Verse 5, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but Adonai has made the heavens. Here, this word 
Elilim, Bible scholars will say it's um, two words in its origin, al meaning not, lim, little gods, and only later would become instead of not gods become used as or translated as idols. I'm not so sure because idolatry seems to be a core motif in the Bible. And I chose idols because for me, what idols are, as Abraham Joshua Heschel defined it, is whenever a means is seen as the ultimate. So you can have all kinds of idols. Money can be an idol when it's seen as the ultimate goal or power or a little object. Other ways that Elilim gets translated, Ibn Ezra translates it essentially as nothings, there is a Midrash, Sifra, Kiddushim 19, that says it's halulim, meaning those things which are hollow. Others will translate it as that which is worthless. Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi, who I mentioned earlier, 1160 to 1235 France, he will say that what's being referred to are the false gods of the moon, the sun, and the stars that are often worshipped. Verse 6, Hod v'hadar lefanav, I translated as grandeur and radiance are before God, but you can hear in the Hebrew there is assonance, meaning the hey sound, hod v'hadar, and so Robert Alter will translate it as greatness and grandeur trying to maintain that poetic quality. When it's referred to as this dimension in verse 6 of God's splendor, and then it's in his, I translate, holy place, circle this word mikdasho, that can, of course, refer to God's temple, where all the nations of the world, in the words of Zechariah, will come and worship before God as one. Sforno and Meiri, medieval commentators, will say it's describing the temple in heaven. Though the same term is used to be heaven itself, as Radak points out, 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 27, or Ezekiel eleven sixteen, uses Mikdashot to describe God as God is the holy place that we come to in exile. Here's some other beautiful kinds of poetic translation. Verse 11, I mentioned Richard Levy, who I only have on a Kindle version on my phone. He was the head of Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles for many years and a saintly figure, a wonderful man. Listen to how he tries to play with alliteration in now rejoicing. Let the sea squall and all sea life sing. He's picking up on Yismechu Hashamayim with an S sound. And again, I mentioned at the outset that I, it really caught my fancy, Rabbi David Kimchi's comment regarding verse 11, that even the fish will sing God's praises. This description of the world rejoicing, all peoples are one. They are all the children of God. All of nature is God's handiwork. And as God is one, as the creator of all, this is a psalm that points to a future time. That's clearly how it's understood by, again, Rashi and Radak that the Shir Hadash, the new song, is the song that will yet be sung in a messianic time of harmony. But the message here is distinctly monotheistic. It's yud heh vav -Hey. This is the God of the Israelites, of the Jewish people, but it's the creator of the whole world to whom all will find unity, through whom all will find unity. So a story about 
animism. Animism is the belief that everything contains God's spirit. And a story for me in Chiang Mai, Thailand. I went to have a morning with Buddhist monks, young Buddhist monks. It was for tourists. I found it in a tourist ad. And there was an older monk who gave this talk about what it is to be a Buddhist monk. And it was all kind of in beautiful language of relinquishment from the worldly. Many of the tourists looked very moved. And then you could have a one-on-one -on -one talk with a monk. So I, I had a young monk, just the two of us. And we talked about his life. He had been in a small village and he had seen a Kung Fu movie. And they were Buddhist monks doing the Kung Fu. So he decided to become, his village was a village of animism, of paganism. One brother would become Christian, but he wanted to learn Kung Fu. So he, he became, he joined a Buddhist order. But then only when he was in it for a while, found out that they didn't do Kung Fu. But he stayed with it. But he told me that's what brought him to it. And he told me this beautiful story. And I said to him, well, so tell me, what's your dream in life? And he said, one day I want to walk in the footsteps of the Buddha. I want to go to India. I said, that's beautiful. And he told me about how by being a Buddhist monk, he was young. He was probably like 19, that he had, you know, was getting an education he otherwise couldn't have gotten. And I said to him, here's a little money. Um, to thank you for your time, but also to help you save it for your dream. And he was moved because he apparently didn't expect to be given some money. And he, I said, he said to me, let me bless you. So he says some words. And I say to him, because he spoke some English, what did you just say to me? Translate it. And he said, you know, a blessing. And I said to him, I'm a rabbi, I'm a priest for Jewish people. If I was blessing somebody, I would say similar words, but I'm speaking to God. You're a Buddhist. Tell me who you're speaking those words to. And he says to me, with his eyes widening, I'm speaking to the spirits all around us. In this tree, there are spirits. There are spirits here everywhere. And I smiled because rather than being the absolute Buddhist of the oneness, he was an animist, which is not unusual in terms of the, you know, bringing folk readings into how religions are lived on the ground around the world. But I tell you that story because it made a big impression on me in terms of animism and this notion that there are this aliveness. Jacob Milgram is a very important Bible scholar, taught at Berkeley for many years, retired in Jerusalem. I had the privilege to spend time with Jacob Milgram. His son, Asher, was a member of the congregation. We had mutual friends. Jacob Milgram spent 20 years writing a commentary to the book of Levit Leviticus, Anchor Bible, 1,700 plus pages a tour de force of 20th century Bible scholarship. And those 1,700 pages were reduced to one volume by the Notre Dame Press that they commissioned him to write after he retired to make his learning more accessible. And here's what Jacob Milgram taught that was very powerful. He taught that Leviticus is a priestly work there being two different groups of priests in Bible language, the B, the P group priest and the Hay group, the H group, the holiness code peoples. But he said that the Bible and Judaism were a distinctive break with the paganism of the world around them. In paganism, spirits were everywhere in every tree. And you couldn't see them, but they were very powerful and foreboding because they had, you know, potential anger. And these spirits had to be appeased. And the role of the priest was to appease the spirits to give you, the worshiper, safety. 
particularly in and around death. And so in the Egyptian culture, which was a kind of paganism, the priest had secret incantations and would speak them esoterically to help a person who died transition into the world of the gods, plural, these spirits. And distinctly in the Bible, a priest was not to have contact with the dead, except immediate family, and then became impure. Distinctly in the Bible, when the priest helped officiate at an offering, it was done on the priest's end in silence. There was no esoteric knowledge. The Bible describes all that the priest was to do. There was no manipulating of spirits. It was all, and this is really the bottom line, all prayer, all offerings were gifts to God, but only God has the power and there is no magic manipulation in the service of that God, according to Jacob Milgram. And so this psalm, to pull it together, is a celebration of Israelite monotheism, the belief that there is only one God, a creator God, who has created an ordered world, a world of emunato, a faithfulness, that it is reliable. My teacher and friend, Brad Artson, said, what is faith? Faith is not an abstraction. Faith is faithfulness to the memories of holy moments, faithfulness to God, faithfulness to how you live your life. And that's the last word, nations with God's faithfulness, that you can rely on God, that the world is fixed firmly, that the nature has an order and more. And that is the punchline of this psalm, that because there is one God, the moral order is also fixed, that there is a right and wrong embedded in creation itself, and that God is coming to judge the earth. And that's looking to the future, but will do so with righteousness with faithfulness. And it's precisely because of the goodness of God marked by morality and the world that is good. My teacher, Rabbi Simon Greenberg, he said that in the creation story, it never says that God created a perfect world. Rather, at the end of each day, God looks and says, it is good. And our greatest religious challenge, Rabbi Simon Greenberg said, is looking at a world and discovering how it is fundamentally a good world, a world of a good creator, creating not only moral order, but also alongside of it, more ostensibly natural order. And with that, at 10 o'clock straight up, I'm delighted now to remove what blocks me from seeing who's here and to see everybody on the screens this morning. Um, I want to pause to honor Ed Sussman, who is in the week of his mourning for his beloved brother, older brother, Alan Sussman. And um, we'll do Kaddish at the end for Alan and for others. So regarding Psalm 96, any thoughts or reactions, questions? There's a lot more detail to share. Looking for somebody to lead the way here. I just want to thank you very much. I really enjoyed the inter your interpretation. It was fascinating. Oh, thank you very much. You're it's your first timer, so keep coming. Okay. You, you'll, you'll, you'll hopefully find that each day, which is one of the things I will add that has been a great delight for me in this more detailed study of the Psalms, is to find that each Psalm 
is distinctive. Sometimes it may even be the same words, but presented with its own reasoning and purpose. So although there's 150 psalms, which is a very big catalog of songs to God, each one has its own flavor. And now we're in the flavors of Kabbalat Shabbat, the psalms that we sing on Friday night that the mystics of Tzfat in the 16th century chose to be the psalms representing the six days of the week. Today, the Monday psalm. Some people say, what gets created on day two? And that's God, you know, separating the waters and creating land. And we'll point to verses 11 and 12, where the heavens are singing and the fields appear in verse 12 as identified with day two. But that's probably not why this is put as the second of those psalms. And again, when we get to Psalm 99, I'll pause and we'll then have the context to look back on these um, selected psalms to represent our work week. Other thoughts or reactions to sing a new song, Psalm 96? I will add this phrase, sing a new song, is not only here, it appears in four other psalms. Psalm 33.3, Psalm 44, Psalm 40, verse 4, Psalm 98, verse 1, Psalm 149, verse 1. But the rabbis will comment in regard to the expression, a new song, that it's in response to something happening as a singularity, something that is a distinctive, unique event. Okay, some reactions. Any other thoughts? If not, I'll point out a couple more things. Shelly's Shelley is trying to get your attention. Oh, okay. Shelby. Alex. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Alex, I'm sorry. Uh, it's okay. Um, verse 12 the, you know, indicates that even, even in, in the most monotheistic of Psalms, there's still a little animism left. Uh, yes. You know, the, the plants in the field and the trees uh, sing. So, in that regard, a few things to say with Alex drawing our attention to this description of verses 11 and 12. In verse 12, you know, the trees of the forest. Richard Levy will have the winds through the trees. So again, he's a contemporary translator. He's going to say it's as if when we hear the rustling of the leaves, we hear the trees singing. So he's stepping away from the trees actually singing to simply our experience of the trees. But no doubt, in all, it's an archetype. This notion of the world being alive in all its nature as having a quality. My teacher and friend, Brad Artson, is a theologian. He did his doctorate at Hebrew Union College on what's called panentheism. And he recently did a series of talks on theology for the Community Scholar Program. So that's OCCSP.net, in which he, Brad Artson, who's very sophisticated science-wise, says, there is embedded in the whole of creation consciousness that's often been ignored. There's a lot of research, for instance, on flowers or plants giving off smells to warn other plants of danger, yeah. as an example. Or there's this beautiful documentary on Netflix called My Octopus Teacher. An oh, octopus yeah. only lives for one year. And what is so, I'm giving away a bit of the punchline, what's so moving about this documentary from South Africa is how the octopus develops a relationship with this diver, actually putting its head at one point and reaching out one of its tentacles, almost like a hug. And what Rabbi Artson would emphasize is there's this quality that is truly surprising 
of qualities of consciousness embedded throughout the whole of creation that points to a grand consciousness, God, the consciousness from which all emerges. So that's another way for me to relate. And that is, there is, you know, a tree is more than an inanimate object. One more free association in that regard, Martin Buber, the great German Jewish theologian would wrote his most famous book called I Thou, in which he said, God is experienced in the in-between. Two people in an I Thou, when the other person is not an object, but a thou, and the relationship has no other goal than to be present together, then that is a holy moment, and God is in the in-between. But Martin Buber and I Thou would say the same thing can be true for a tree that any creation, when you're experiencing it not as an it, an object to serve you, but as a living presence to encounter, there too you can have a holy moment. And so that's another association, Alex, to say that this description of the world singing God's praises can be our experience as humans with the world around us to experience the world as alive to God's presence, to consciousness. But that's not to duck the reality of a cultural phenomenon of animism being, you know, but a thin line to the other side, which is that there are forces, even independent spirit forces, um, that are vying for attention. But uniquely to monotheism, as it will develop and unfold, is that all of these forces are but under God's control. And so I'll do this to conclude. Recount among the peoples God's glory, among the nations God's wonders. For great is Adonai and very praiseworthy. Awesome is God above all gods. No Rahu I'll call Elohim with a small g for gods. Next week we'll be looking at Psalms 97, 98, and 99. You'll be tomorrow night if you're in synagogue chanting those words as part of Kabbalah Shabbat. In our study together I have gained the opportunity to go more deeply into these psalms. Psalm 96, the psalm of rejoicing, a psalm celebrating creation, for Shabbat is a day in which we pause to experience the magnificence of creation, but more, the moral order as well embedded in creation. And so I am delighted today to have Marvin as our honoree, and I ask Marvin that you just say a few words, a few sentences about the study of Psalms or Shabbat, and um, we'll segue with Marvin's introduction to saying Kaddish. Go ahead, Marvin. Unmute yourself. I, your exposition of Psalm 96 is an example of why I come every third for three days a week. It is so replete with information that I would never have gotten out myself from just reading the story, uh, from reading the, the thing. And let, let me just tell you what I do. I have the JPS volume, okay, which is this one. And I write in the margin the differences between your translation and its translation and try to uh, describe or to assim assimilate both of these and see how yours differs from that. And one of the other things that I do may, 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 may be correct or not, but I have a copy of the Jerusalem Bible, which of course is not a Jewish Bible. And I have this Jerusalem Bible is like our Tanakh. And I read their Psalms to deliver, you know, translation. 
and compare all three as you are talking, but all the explanation that you apply and, and deliver to those of us, I think we are so, I think, uh, precious to, to receive all of that from you. I could never have gotten it anywhere else. And that's where I, why I come back every, every day. Thank you, Marvin. Well, I just want to say to Marvin, thank you for being a regular. I love you and I admire you. And having you again puts wind in my sails. And I just want to add in light of Marvin's comments of uh, both these Psalms being important to Jews and to Christians, that the last three lines, verses 11 and 13 of this psalm, are sung in the Catholic Mass on Christmas Eve. It's the foundation for the Christmas carol, Joy to the World. It was put to music both by Handel and by Mendelssohn. And in my mailing for today, you also have a popular melody of Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach in yeah. the Jewish context for the singing of this psalm. With that, I again am glad that we were able to dedicate our study today to honor Marvin. Kaddish is now recited honoring our family for those who are observing a yurt site or who are in mourning. Yitkadal the Yitkadash Shemei Rabban. Amen. Alma Dibra Kirutei. Amen. I wish you all a Shabbat Shalom in that once, you know, the menorah, the seven branched menorah, the rabbis say is supposed to remind us of Shabbat. Shabbat's the higher, the middle of the seven. And when you leave Shabbat for three days, you're always looking back at the last Shabbat. And then starting with Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're looking forward to the next Shabbat. So you can already begin to wish people Shabbat Shalom on Wednesday. And so since it's Thursday, I wish you a Shabbat Shalom. And I thank you all for participating and look to see you next week as we continue Kabbalah Shabbat. Thank Be you. well and thank you.